However, Emil Brunner is perhaps even more forthright than Niebuhr. Brunner is so obviously and so vigorously irrational <coughs> that only a point or two need be mentioned. He holds that God can speak his word to a man even in false propositions. That is, God can tell lies, but it's still his word. He holds that the Bible is consistently inconsistent. Theology is not concerned with intelligible, rational truth. In German, einsichtige Vernunftwahrheit. I think you would say that's intelligible, rational truth. Further, God and the medium of conceptuality, Begrifflichkeit, God and the medium of conceptuality are mutually exclusive. The contradictions in the Bible are evidences of God's condescension to us. No one can be sure which of the several systems in the Bible is the echo of the divine word because there is no ambiguous, there is no ambiguous criterion. Oh, that's a mistake. There is no unambiguous criterion by which to distinguish them. Uh, that must be unambiguous, isn't it? Oh, that's a bad typographical error. You see, that's the way sensation always deceives you. You read the manuscript and you don't see the uh, words that are there. You see words that aren't there. And so you must never trust your senses when you correct a manuscript. It could have been yeah, if it creeps. <laughs> Finally, with obvious points of dependence on Kierkegaard, Brunner makes full use of paradox. Although the present writer is reasonably confident that he has correctly stated the position of these theologians, even in details, historical accuracy is not the main point. The point is the irrationality of irrationalism. Hence, the concluding sub subsection returns to Kierkegaard. Did you find another typographical error? Yeah, accuracy is so wrong. Oh, terrible. Where's that? The third to last line. Oh, yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when when I publish a manuscript, it's uh, typography, it's spelling and so on, <coughs> are usually examined by at least two people and three or four times. That simply shows how unreli unreliable sensation is. Irrationalism makes it useless to ask what the object of faith is. Faith really has no object, and Kierkegaard really has no faith. The case of Pascal is an interesting comparison because Kierkegaard's disciples try to enhance his reputation with the reflections with the reflection of the French philosopher's luster. In their, irrash, in their irrationalism, these disciples stress decisions in opposition to conclusions. They speak of a wager, as Brunner in particularly does, uh, and of course referring to Pascal's wager, and for other reasons claim Pascal as a kindred spirit. You all know what Pascal's wager is, don't you? Do you? Yeah. Good. You ought to. But the difference between <coughs> Kierkegaard and Brunner on the one hand and Pascal on the other is rather enormous. Pascal's wager was a mathematical calculation of odds, such as gamblers use. If you win two cents for tossing a head, 
and lose only one cent for tossing a tail, you should by all means gamble. It is hardly a gamble at all, for you are sure to win in the long run. Since there are just two possibilities, you will win half the time and lose half the time. But since when you win, you win twice as much, well, it's pretty obvious, is it not? Now, Pascal's wager was equally mathematical, but the odds were infinitely better. Either there is a God or there is not, just like heads and tails. But instead of winning two cents and losing one cent, if you bet on God and win, you win infinitely. Well, if you lose, you lose nothing. Conversely, if you bet against God and win, you win nothing. But if you lose, you lose eternal life. In his wager, Pascal offers objective mathematical chance. The odds can be calculated. There's nothing irrational. <coughs> The object of faith is also definite, namely God. In particular, Pascal does not ask us to believe two contradictory propositions at the same time. Pascal and Kierkegaard are poles apart. This concludes Dr. Clark's lecture entitled Ir